Hello, Goyam. Welcome. Today, we will be talking... Let me just change this a little bit. Can you hear me better? We will be talking about our inner nature. So, this is something that's been around for a while. The idea that we are not just one thing, we're a multiplicity. Different people have ways of dissecting it, and it's good to look at a bunch of different views of what it means to be human, or what is a human, really. Because the term human becomes very vague in some instances. So, when we talk about the tripart nature of man, what we do is we break up man, and I do it, or the esoterically it's done a little bit differently than it's done in, like, say, Christianity. But you can still use the terms like, you know, spirit, soul, and body. But basically what it is is, there's one thing that's eternal, one thing that's temporal, and the thing in the middle is something that perpetuates ad infinitum through time, but is subject to change up and down. So, perhaps we'll begin at the bottom, or we'll begin at the top. So the spirit, or Atman, or the intimus, the intimate, that part of us is eternal. It's kind of like, you know, think of like a kernel in the middle of a, uh, in the middle of a stone fruit. It's just that bit there that's eternal, that is God, basically. Our own spirit is basically our inner God within us. Our inner Atman, our inner intimus, he's the architect that if we are able to connect to, you know, then we can, then we can, then we can do some special things, then we're, you could say that person is a master. Or really, that's what any type of gnosis is. It said, uh, I remember one person saying once, any, you know, for a troop to truly be called Gnostic, basically, or someone to be called Gnostic, basically it's their essence has a relationship with their spirit. And for any group to be called a Gnostic group, it's where there are a bunch of people whose essences are in communion with their spirit and they are able to share their experiences. So, the spirit is that thing in the middle, and then everything else grows around it. All the, uh, you know, it projects its essence into the world, or its soul. And the soul then gets coated with a being body, as Gurdjieff would say. And through the experiences, the impressions that come in, those go into the soul. The emotions, the thoughts, the fantasies, the imaginations. The emotions, negative, negative and positive. Desires. Altruism, virtues, <laughs> not virtues, all of these things are a part of the soul. And the soul is basically something undefined. It's something that's created. In most people, they don't really have soul. They just have a type of psychic material that kind of builds up around their spirit. It's basically the thing that cloaks, like, cloaks the spirit. The spirit is a fire, and the soul is an alabaster vase, if you want to think of it like that. So, people who do esoteric work, people who do, you know, in meditations, or specific uh, workings in meditations, go through specific systems or achieve mastery, what, what, is, what is it supposed to do? What is meditation supposed to do? I always like saying, you know, go to a Buddhist retreat or go to a yoga class or something and see all the all the women there in their lululemon yoga pants and like go around and ask them well, what do you want to get from yoga what do you want to get from meditation you, usually they'll say something like peace of mind or just relax or learn to concentrate better or if it's a guy there he'll say maybe improve his business but almost none of them will say enlightenment almost none of them will say immortality none of them will say i want to escape from this demiurgic creation and that's basically it the soul itself has become, well, yeah, I kind of said it, undefined, it's become loose, it's become a bit of a mess. What we want is to bring order back into it, make it a strong, robust soul. It said that, I'm not sure, but it said that like it takes shapes and some people connect it to like the platonic solids, like as if, you know, from the ancient Pythagorean schools, like the soul actually becomes a sphere, but then can actually kind of take different shapes, and the final shape, the, what is it, the isohedron, 20-sided isohedron, iso isodecahedron or something, 
that's actually like the shape of the Philosopher's Stone. So someone who's the Philosopher's Stone really, or internal, the internal Philosopher's Stone is, the internal Philosopher's Stone is the soul that take, is able to take the shape of an isodecahedron permanently. That's the correct, it's not a dodecahedron, is it anyway? I gotta look up my platonic solids. So that soul is worked, that soul has attributes, and it's the soul that reincarnates and returns. And this is the explanation where you have systems that say, no, you only come back once, or no, you can reincarnate. The idea is, is really that someone who doesn't really have any definition, someone who's just like kind of a muck of attributes just splashed across the, you know, just kind of glomped around the spirit, that thing doesn't really, you know, when it returns into a new body, what's, what's continued? There are vague attributes and whatnot, but no real memories. It's wrong to say reincarnation. We kind of overuse that. It's more that it returns. There is something that returns. Some, uh, it's, and what are those things? It's basically a network of attributes that basically a set of attributes that just kind of go from one body to the next. The best way to look at it is uh, from a Julius Evola term where he basically says, imagine like, uh, imagine a war and imagine a, a group of army soldiers on the front lines and they move forward and they attack the enemy and they all get killed. Well, they all get killed and perhaps their bodies are returned, but then that's it. Then there needs to be a start again and then more soldiers are trained up and then the next wave happens. And this is basically what life is. The general is the spirit. And the attributes of the soul are just the little privates, the soldiers that go off into battle. But every now and then, if you do esoteric work, if you, you know, do any working of celestial magic, uh, sacred magic theurgy, if you practice deep meditation, and de you know, if you go deep into trying to understand yourself, know yourself, depth psychology, something like that, you can act, uh, something may become worthy of existence in a sense. So the wave of soldiers may go out and attack the enemy, but some sometimes some may, soldiers may come back alive. And then what? Then you have a promotion, then a soldier's a corporal. And then there's basically some attributes crystallize and then can go from life to life. Most attributes in people will shift. They may be a king in one life, and in the next life, they incarnate or return into a new life. And I don't know they're in a peasant, the peasant somewhere, and due to socio-political circumstances, they just become a degenerate. So it's like they're a king one life, next life they're a degenerate peasant, the next life they're an artist in Venice, in the next life they're a scientist in Asia, in the next life they're. Uh, you know, a horse warrior in Mongolia in the next life, they're a terrible drunk, etc, etc. Ad infinitum, there's nothing consistent. Someone who's truly human is someone who has consistency, someone who has attributes in them that are crystallized, that are permanent, that go from life to life. And the whole idea is eventually some formation, some group of soldiers will actually go out to fight and they'll actually win. And when that happens, then there's something, that's immortality. Then there is something worthy to be kept. Then the spirit kind of crystallizes that set in that shape. And that's, you know, someone who has real soul then. And what are they fighting against in this example? What they're fighting against is the ego, is the I, is the desires. Desires, uh, animalistic urges, impulses. Uh, negative habits, the mind itself. All of these things, if you're able to defeat these things, if you're able to defeat the dragon of darkness, then then you gain a real soul. Real soul, real organized, robust soul. And it's interesting because it said that powers uh, grow on the soul. So powers, the, you know, things that we want, whether they be clairvoyance or clairaudience, of the ability to astrally project, or even if you want to go real matrixy or fantasy and be like, I want to shoot lightning bolts or whatever. Apparently all of those things uh, that they are possible are attributes of the soul, not of the personality or the physical body, but of the soul. So it's interesting when you die, you take your powers with you. 
The soul is then a conglomeration. It is all of your attributes, all of your virtues, all of your conscious experiences, and all of your powers, but ordered in a way, ordered in a specific succession that uh, gives you robustness, that gives you force. So this thing also has to incarnate into something, right? Well, the soul has to be, get coated with something, you know, physical matter to exist in the world, and this is our physical body. And this is interesting because this is something else in between the soul world and the astral. You know, we can go and talk about astral and mental world and etheric, uh, the etheric world. The astral and the mental world are more closer to the regions of the soul, whereas the physical body is in a physical world, and there's also the etheric body. And it's interesting to note, even though the etheric body, the etheric world, is, you know, above the physical, it's, a, it's more spiritual, so to speak. When you die, when you die, when your body ceases to work, what survives? Obviously the spirit survives, and obviously the attributes of the soul survives. But what also dies with the body is also the etheric body. So each life, your astral body and your mental body may be the same, your soul will be the same, your spirit will be the same, your consciousness will be the same, your superior divine monad will be the same, etc, etc, etc. The etheric body also dies. And that's very interesting because uh, in, I believe it's Max Heindel's Rosicrucian School, he talks about the four different ethers. I'm pretty sure there's actually a book just called The Four Ethers. And in that book they talk about the four ethers, the chemical ether, the ether of life, the luminous and the reflective ether, which is interesting to note. The, there's four of them, but there are two superior ones, which are the luminous and the reflective. So he says that the luminous ether is to do with senses, like obviously vision and whatnot, and the reflective ether is to do with memory. And the thing he says about this is, is when you die, yeah, the etheric body dies, but those ethers actually get absorbed into the astral body and get taken from life to life. So this is something else that's interesting because, you know, what is clairvoyance? What is clairaudience? What is the extension of smell and taste and touch into the internal worlds, but really uh, an over-exaggeration of the amount of luminous ether? By transmuting your sexual energy, which is a type of ether, really, or has ether in it, or has an etheric component, that's why you keep your sexual energy within yourself, and you never expend it. You only transmute it, or if you have a partner, you practice sexual tantra. Not spilling the seed with your partner, but transmuting it inwards and upwards during the sexual act, ritualizing it. This is sexual magic. And in doing this, you create within you more luminous ether. And this not only can intensify your own experiences, your own uh, senses, it also extends your senses. So there's the possibility of gaining uh, the impressions from the etheric and the astral and the more spiritual worlds while you're in the physical. This is what those powers really are. They're just an extension of consciousness. So you're extending, you're collecting more luminous ether, and that goes from life to life to life. Same with the reflective ether, which is memory. So your memory can increase. But what is the reflective ether but um, a film that basically records your experiences? So really your reflective ether goes from life to life to life. It records all of your past lives on it. So you're able to, rem you someone with a large amount of reflective ether, or perhaps even normal people who claim to remember their past lives, it may just be that they incidentally have a large amount of reflective ether. Or perhaps they did some occult working in a past life, but they uh, they didn't crystallize the soul, but some attribute crystallized within them, and perhaps there was something connected with the reflective ether, and that's why they appear to just be a normal person. Maybe they're nice, they're nice, they're nice people, they seem more spiritual, but really the only thing different about them is their memory of past lives due to their uh, enormous reservoir of reflective ether. So that's something to kind of keep in mind. That's something more at the body level. So there's spirit, which is the eternal thing, the architect, which is you. It's, your, it's you as a superman. It's you with no, no negative attributes. Your spirit is basically you. Imagine yourself without any doubt. Imagine yourself with only courage, no fear, no paranoia, no anxiety, no depression, just you at your maximum. That's like, that's basically the spirit. It's the archetype. It's the thing that it wants you. It wants you to become it, but in the physical world. So there's the spirit, the eternal thing. There's the soul around it, which 
is a, basically a collection of random attributes which can crystallize into something greater. And then there's the physical body, which I would class actually the personality around in the physical body. And the personality really doesn't uh, crystallize or immortalize. Only the attributes from the personality move from life to life to life. So the personality is just built up of, once again, social circumstances, society, your family, zodiacal influences, and these are things to be transcended. There's nothing really venerable in the personality. It's just personality. Your personality is just there for communicating with other beings in the physical world. You don't really need it. So don't, you know, don't be so, I don't know, <laughs> don't be so forlorn that your personality is going to die or you're going to lose it. They're, they're a dime a dozen. And the whole thing is, is to transcend your basic personality. Your personality is just a filter. It's just a filter for your ego and your essence. Hopefully, in a sense, if you dissolve all of your ego, there's only two things left. There's, there's, when you're completely pure, there's only two things that operate. One is the instincts, and the other is the spirit. So it's those two things. The instincts obviously will operate in the world and guide you through life. And of course, the spirit will be the superior thing which speaks to you through intuition. In a way, you could say almost those two things are the same thing. Uh, I like there's a line that says something like, uh, intuition is instinct that has become self-conscious. So that's perhaps uh, something more mystical and that goes beyond this little talk, but nonetheless, your body dies with the etheric body and your personality. Those three, all those three things die. The soul goes from life to life to life, and really that's what we're trying to work with. Really that's what we're trying to immortalize. You can potentially immortalize your body, but if you can immortalize your soul, that's, that's, where, the real, that's where the real stuff is. You want you know the soul's a bit heavy, man. You want you don't want to escape, go to other dimensions, go to other worlds. You gotta you gotta immortalize the soul. That's where it's at. And of course, the spirit is the guide. There are things talking about the spirit. They said there are four things that um, have a plan for us in the in this world. There is the white lodge, the black lodge, the lords of karma, and our own spirit. They all have a different plan for us. And a good question is, what do you think <laughs> the plan, which, which plan do you think we should follow? It's the spirit. Yeah. Pause, pause your video and try to find, think of the answer. It's the spirit. You don't want to follow the Black Lodge. They're going to douche you over. White Lodge? Sure. Be a nice person. Sacrifice for humanity. Lords of Karma? Balance your karmic debt, make the world a better place through, you know, balancing the cosmic scales of the law. Okay. Your spirit is the one who really is looking after you. Your spirit is you. Your spirit has all the knowledge of all of your past lives perfectly. It, with the reflective ether, your personality can learn about your past lives through reflective ether. Um, but it said the reflective ether is, like, cloudy, and it's not that good. Which, if you can... Uh, connects to the Akashic Records, it said that that's better. What are the Akashic Records? The Akashic Records are basic, is basically just the reflective ether of the entire planet. The entire planet isn't just a dead rock, it's something living, and therefore it has its own etheric body. And therefore anything that happens on the Earth is recorded within its own reflective ether. So, the Akashic Records are potentially better than your own reflective ether, but let's not get into any conspiracy theories about uh, beings that try to change the Akashic Records or anything. But nonetheless, so, I kind of rambled, but those, this is another way of looking at the self, looking at the human, the microcosm, and trying to understand our work. Our work is obviously trying to connect to the spirit to guide us. Our work is obviously trying to balance and keep the body healthy. But really the main work is becoming immortal. The mystery of life is just to become, what is the meaning of life? The meaning of life is just to become conscious, is to be conscious itself. The mystery of death is to learn about immortality, is to learn about these, this attribute, this, these attributes, these moving through life to life, this creation of soul. That's the mystery of death. Anyway, I've rambled enough. 
I hope you enjoyed that. Like and subscribe or don't. Keep it. A, keep this channel a secret. That may be better. Who knows? Anyway, have a nice day. See you next week. Any topics you want me to ramble on about, just I don't know, put in the comments, I guess. Bye.